Right, so we're officially on the recording mode and we kind of finished you know last lecture you know uh, showing you you know this diagram and what I tried to explain to everybody was essentially it might seem a little bit odd that we spend a lot of time studying plankton but basically you cannot actually understand how the ocean works without actually understanding how plankton dynamic works. Now you might also say now, oh, this is a bit odd because I really want to actually, you know, work on leopard seals or killer rays or whatever. But the point is none of that actually would exist if it weren't actually not for plankton primary reproduction and particularly the sewer plankton, which packages all that productivity up to become available to other consumers. Now, then we basically start off on this kind of gory image, which is of course a, a white shark, you know, the, you know, being presented here, and it looks a little bit, you know, you know, bloody uh, for the same reason that essentially, you know, people have this impression that. Ecology is sometimes all a little bit airy fairy and nice, but it actually isn't. It's all about increasing fitness. And fitness, you know, comes for big things which swim, you know, in the form of basically producing as many, you know, uh, offspring as possible. And, so, and, I, I, and I actually think, and look at this particular form here, we're going to come back to that in about, you know, 17 minutes. It's actually incredibly um, fascinating how ecology or evolution has shaped some of our bigger swimming things in the way to optimize really their you know, performance. If you ever go and design a yacht or build a boat, you know, you can actually do better than that. So let's see if this thing actually works. Yep, very good. If you've ever had a nightmare about being pursued by a great white shark, this is what it would look like swimming up behind you. And on this occasion, it even gets close enough to try and take a bite, scratching the camera with its razor sharp teeth. These stunning submarine images were filmed by Emmy Award winning underwater cameraman Charles Maxwell in the waters of False Bay off the coast of Cape Town. Attached to the back of his 7.5 meter rib, the rear facing camera or tow cam is always switched on. It's of course all a bit amusing. This thing is about two years old. Uh, I could actually quickly get it from the garage if I can find it quickly. You know, I have a, a housing for a GoPro camera which you can tow behind the boat. You can buy it from eBay for about 50 bucks and you can actually tow it behind any pleasure boat you want. And you see a lot of stuff. If you have a GoPro camera, invest in one of those towed housings. It's actually quite, However, quite fascinating. So, you know, there's a lot of footage out there about sharks. And here's another one, which I think, of course, is the one which is the most fascinating of them all. And it also comes from South Africa. You can actually go and do shark diving there. Talk to Chris about it. He actually volunteered for one of the organizations there for half a year. Um, what I find particularly fascinating, a few you know, uh, you know, years ago, we were in Kakura in New Zealand, and you walk past the sign and say, swim with the seals. Now, you know, you never want to actually swim with the seals because seals are prime food for sharks. So, which is kind of really very, very peculiar. And you can actually see that in this footage here, how, how much of a preferred food item there.
to be killed with a feast. But the shark has to catch the man first. <laughs> Now, if you look at the shark footage, and we will actually come back to that, is look at the enormously large stabilizing fins at the front. Ah, got my light. Right. So essentially, uh, what we are talking about is, you know, we talk about things which are big and which can swim, and they're not necessarily at the mercy of the currents, and that actually sets them apart from the plankton which we talked about last week. So essentially, you know, the nekton is a very, very large group. And most people say, well, of course, it got fish, but it also got seals, it got turtles, it got penguins, it got blue whales, and it got large squid. So it's a very, very diverse group, but ultimately it's all about big swimming, you know, uh, you know, uh, zoology. So, you know, the, it's, it's very, very difficult, you know, to give a, how can I go, how can I get just one? It's very, very difficult to give a you know, two-hour lecture about you know, what most people are most fascinated in, but let me assure you, you're going to actually return to nectonic things over and over in your education. So I'm just giving you the first taste getting into it. And also, people say it might be a little bit difficult for me to actually experience, you know, those kind of things because you know you're going to show me images from South Africa or whatever. Well, have a look at that, and that's not very far from the Sunshine Coast, and you can actually put your uh, iPhone in a plastic bag or have a GoPro. This is what my kids did, and it's right there. So, Nekton, of course, we didn't feed it. Don't tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually all right uh, around us. And, you know, we can all experience it quite, you know, uh, easily. It's not something which remote, which is remote. And you can just go, uh, there was a particular funny, you know, episode of that. Um, because I, I chucked the GoPro with a little float into the water, you know, because I thought it's coming back to the beach and I had to go for a, quite a long swim around the shark boy, but never mind. But you can actually buy yourself, uh, you know, uh, some goggies and fins and off you go. So it's not something remote. There we go. Uh, somebody asked me on the last lecture, you know, what this thing is. It's an oar fish. It's extremely slender and extremely long. Here's the jaws. And of course, you know, those are often organisms, which is quite interesting if you think about it, which never touch the bottom. They never ever in their entire life come in contact, you know, with the seafloor. So it's quite peculiar, really, if you come actually to think about it, that you have organisms. It would be like a bird who never roosts. Uh, and we don't actually have that. Even albatrosses, which actually, you know, sail for hours and hours or days, eventually sometimes have to get down onto the water. And some of the most spectacular holo which basically means 
they spent the entire time in, a, in the open water body are things like the treasure sharks here, flying fishes, you know, billfishes. If you, ah, I forgot to buy some tuna. Bugger. Somebody remind me uh, and I will show you next time. I, I was actually meant to actually buy a piece of tuna. Uh, marlin swordfishes, oarfishes, and sunfishes. So we do actually have this really exclusive club of species which only, you know, live in the open water very far from land. This rare footage of a sunfish we have, I have only ever seen one sunfish, uh, which was basically, you know, washed up on Fraser Island, which was basically, you know, about three meters across. One day. And this one is spectacular. Look at the size of this thing. Right, and then you have, you have treasure sharks, which I actually think are a little bit, you know, they have a bit more action. This actually, no, it doesn't work. Ah, oh, come on. Well, any case. So, let's go back, you know, to the very basics of zoology. Zoologically, physiology, I should say. Right, oh, interesting. What's happening now? All right, we have a bit of a freeze, sorry for that. Go back here. Now, if you want to get around, uh, bugger. <laughs> if you want to get around the Earth, you have three, uh, Possibilities, oh, please. I clearly hang on. Bear with me. It sort of thinks I have to actually externally access that video for some strange reason and task of figure. Right. So, so if you want to get around the earth, you have actually three options. You know, you can fly, you can swim, and you can run or walk like a mammal, like we do. Now, and there's this concept which the physiologists have developed. It's called the cost of transport. The cost of transport is essentially quite a simple concept, and it basically means how much energy do you have to spend if you don't walk, you know, walk or run or fly particularly fast, what is the minimum energy you know, that you need for you to go from point A to point B? And we also know from physiology, you probably remember those examples of hummingbirds versus blue whales, that essentially energy expenditure decreases exponentially as you become bigger. So a very, very small animal has a proportionally higher expenditure. Now then, it, then you can actually work out, you know, uh, that you know, uh, running for a given body size is energetically much more expensive than flying or swimming. Now you might say, "Oh, this is particularly odd. Flying is actually energetically more favorable." The simple reason is that once a bird is up, they're actually very lightly built. They can actually glide or soar for long periods of time. Swimming, on the other hand, is the most energetically favorable option of them all. And the success of the nectar in the ocean is partly true that essentially, uh, energetically speaking, it's a very, very good way to get around. And that also means the ocean supports by far the largest organisms on Earth. We don't have a basically, you know, 30 ton, you know, uh, mammal, you know, roaming the Earth, but we have actually many very, very large organisms in the sea. The reason for that is it's energetically feasible. Now, how come it basically is feasible? Well, there is Quite a bit of de uh, debate lately about that. Um, 
but it all basically comes down to the fact that it is physiologically very advantageous to be big and to be warm-blooded. The reason for that is if you have a bigger body size, you also can store more oxygen because the oxygen capacity as a magpie, you know, trying to get in, get some food, uh, the oxygen, you know, storage capacity increases faster than the body size. So essentially, you can actually, as a big bodied marine organism, exploit prey over longer distances. You also have to take into account if you're an ectoderm, like a turtle, life actually works, but it actually works a lot slower. So essentially, you have, you know, physiologically uh, constraints on the ability to move. But basically being bigger and being warm-blooded is key to the success. Now, this is a very, very you know, basic diagram, but I kind of love it because it actually is supposed to illustrate that there is no such thing as a fish. What do I mean by that? Aside from birds, fishes are the one group of vertebrates who have the biggest diversification in body shapes and they have literally you know created some rather bizarre forms you can have what we actually call a very very basic fish basic body shape which is a generalized you know like a perch or a carangid but it actually can then actually go into uh, you know becoming a cruising specialist or you live amongst corals or you basically become an ambush predator now here is you know uh, a bit of a metaphor uh, and the first thing you can actually decide uh, if you're a fish let's say you have the ability to decide that you've got a bit of a magpie fight up there uh, is you know do you actually want to become a sprinter or do you want to have a big body and be there for high impact what do you actually mean by that Essentially, you can, you know, be a bluefin tuna or you become, you know, a porcupine fish. And both body shapes are very, very successful. Now, I have an old book, you know, uh, a French book on sea fishes of Noumea and the South Pacific. And I just give you some examples from that. Here is probably, you know, the basic fish shape, you know, which we all recognize as a carangid or a crow trout. Then it morphs a little bit more to a faster swinging carax. You can have specialists with a very, you know, compressed body, which live amongst the corals. Here's the most extreme of them, a batfish. You can have lionfish, which basically hang out underneath the corals and then actually attack the prey. It's actually quite funny. The, the best place to actually see lionfish, if you ever go to a tropical resort, they often have fenced off swimming areas and people think that's actually very safe, so they actually swim out and they hang on to the boy, just actually look underneath. Quite often the lionfish actually sit underneath there, just where the chain goes onto the boy. Then you have specialists which actually are slow moving but big bodied and they have chores like parrots and that's what they're called parrotfish and they basically nip the cores and extract the algae out of it. And then you can have really bizarre life forms like, you know, the leafy sea dragon which lives amongst uh, seagrass and kelp and idle bats and actually just you know sucks in little mysids. Remember the mysids I told you about, which have the bruise pouch and you know I did my you know master's work, my first paper on mysids. So those guys actually live on them. You can have an anglerfish which have you know appendages, skin appendages, which are meant to actually mimic a uh, room and then you know some unsuspecting fish comes along here like rah, you know in it goes. And we can have even flying fish with massively uh, big uh, pectoral fins. And those pectoral fins then basically enable the fish to glide as they accelerate with their big you know, tail fin uh, out of the water. Uh, that's supposed to be a video. We are not having much luck with the videos today. Oh, maybe. No. 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 Oh, here we go. 
Not bad. That cover blown. Right, so then you can actually ask yourself, if you were to design a fish which is designed for us fast swimming, and we're taking a bit of an engineering perspective now to that swimming question, what do you have to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to work on your frictional drag. Remember the controversy about it was about 10 years ago when, when some of the Australian swimmers actually downed those shark skin suits. And the whole idea was basically when water moves over your body, you have to basically displace it. But it's not only the displacement, it's also a drag, a frictional force on your skin. And they basically, you know, tried to emulate, you know, uh, the shark, you know, uh, uh, skin which is very very effective in, in doing that and eventually it got semi banned by the international swimming uh, configuration uh, association but if you want to be a good swimmer you want to actually look like an orange why because a sphere is the perfect shape in relation to volume you want lots of volume because volume means muscle and muscle means power but in relation to the muscle, it has the smallest surface area. So you could actually put, you know, uh, say simply, if you want to be a fish with low surface drag, be a blob. Now that's not terribly good, you know, because very few uh, fish are actually blobs. You could say, well, if I push an orange through the water, ooh, I got an egg here, never mind, you know, yeah. Well, I could get an orange. It actually has a lot more drag, you know, than uh, any other bodies because there's a lot of form drag. That's what we actually call it. So, if you actually want to reduce form drag, oh, look at this. What you actually want to do is you want to, you know, be the shape of a cigar. Now, I gave up smoking cigars, but think about a clout. Here we go. You know, this is, a, this is actually an advantage of lecturing at home. You should actually be like a cigar. Maybe I could actually buy cigars on USC accounts and we smoke some. And and that is actually a good shape if you know you want to actually you know reduce uh, your form track. So few fish are of course you know uh, shaped uh, like an orange or an egg or you know a carrot. Because there's also the problem when you actually push very fast to the water, you know, you create turbulence. And turbulence is really one of the one things you want to uh, uh, avoid because it actually uh, is, you know, terrible in terms of you know, uh, uh, impeding your progress. Now, here's, of course, a movie. You know, if you like, you know, war movies, you can actually watch Dust Bolt, which is basically, you know, something about, you know, a German submarine or you can watch the same thing you know the hunt for the red october and essentially you know uh submarines are shaped the way they are because it turns out to be the case oh look at this this could be actually a submarine if you actually take the things off of this cover this could actually be going a submarine through the ocean why because you know Turbulence is reduced when you have this particular shape. It's a torpedo shape. Hence, think about a carrot or you know a submarine. Uh, that is the perfect shape if you just want to you know get you know less turbulence. So far, so good. The other thing you actually want to do, and that's why I wanted to buy some fish, uh, and I forgot today. I am sorry. Uh, oh, I got some salmon.
Look, look at this. Yeah. If you actually, you know, uh, buy even sliced salmon or a fresh one, what you can actually see is between, you know, the uh, orange bits, they're sort of white lines. And when you actually fillet the fish, you see them quite prominently. Um, ooh, that's off, you know, <laughs> they use by tight, they will be fine. And basically fish have a very, very strange uh, arrangement of muscles. And the muscles basically run in little, you know, strips down the side. This is why a fish can actually swim like this. And we have great difficulty because we got a very uh, inflexible spine, but also we don't actually have muscles running the sides, you know, of our body to actually throw us into a good curve. Fish actually do have this. And it's a very, very unique arrangement in the animal kingdom. No other vertebrate group, you know, except maybe for snakes, but not actually really uh, develop that unique, you know, arrangement of muscles. So this is, I, I kind of quite like that one, you know, because it is a robot developed by a Swedish uh, uh, engineering company called Kongsberg, uh, because they thought for probably, you know, a few thousand years, we have been pretty much using the same technology to actually power our ships. And that's basically having something, you know, at the back developing thrust. And I said, well, could we actually do something which emulates a fish, or almost like a swimming snake, with that lateral movement? So, you know, engineers have actually taken it up. Here's, of course, something very, very different. You can actually even flap your wings to actually, you know, move. But that's very, very rare. The most, you know, uh, common thing is that they have fins. Fish have fins and they actually use them to give them forward propulsion. Now you might say, what's, you know, in it for me, you know, to know about fin shape? Well, you can actually look at a fish and pretty much determine how fast its swimming ability is going to be. If you look at one of those suckers here, that's a scalpin. They have a very, very rounded fin, which is a large surface area, but it's actually not very high. If you look at a tuna, it has a reasonable surface area, but it's got a very, very distinct shape. It's very, very high. And of course, the extreme uh, is, is something like, you know, uh, a treasure shark, where, you know, the ratio of the height, basically, to the area is enormous and mechanically engineers actually call this the aspect ratio which is basically the fin height squared over the fin area and the higher your aspect ratio is the more of a fast swimming specialist you are in terms of you know forward movement as a fish here's just an example like you have a tuna got an aspect ratio of about 7.5 and here's that little you know goby which really, you know, is very slow moving with an aspect ratio of 0 0.6. Here you can see all different types of fish. And, you know, essentially you have a heterocircle shark here, a treasure shark. I, I love those guys with an enormous, you know, ratio. You have a little box fish, which, you know, flaps its wings. You got a goby here at the bottom which essentially is just a, you know, frantic fish, doesn't have to swim very fast and very far ever. And here you have a bunch of rays, you know, flapping the wings. Right, so if you do a comparison, you know, between, you know, a really fast swimming fish, you know, you know, I know it's a stupid example, but I had to put it in, you know, being a Ferrari, it's a bluefin tuna, you have you know, they can swim just over 100 k's per hour, which is actually quite remarkable. And of course, if you have a goldfish at home, that's sort of, you know, the Land Rover Sirius 1, 88 inch equivalent. If you ever actually own one of those, I think, you know, five kilometers per hour is a bit of a 
execration because it hardly ever runs, but that's you know something completely different. So fish can swim remarkably fast. Uh, you know, we have these things about a cheetah getting, you know, uh, you know, up to about 80 k's an hour or whatever. But we actually have many of the game fish which regularly, you know, cruise at speeds over 100 kilometers an hour, and they can do that for extended periods of time. So, if you want to be a real bullet in the sea, so to speak, and be enormously, you know, fast swimming. The first thing you need to do is actually streamline your body. So we talked about form drag, we talked about uh, frictional drag and about turbulence. Essentially, you become a submarine or a torpedo. You want to have a highly efficient coil fin. Your torsal fins here, they retract. You can actually, you know, play with that when you have a freshly caught tuna because at high speeds, you want to actually reduce that extra form drag there. You have very small scales. They have a very smooth skin, uh, just like a highly polished race car. Uh, of course, I used to have a, you know, well, my daughter, one of my daughters had a, you know, goldfish, which does bulging eyes, which we call Klubschi. And he was, of course, the very smallest one, but he actually lived the longest. And you wouldn't actually have one of those eyes on stalks if you swim 100 k's an hour, because it all goes a little bit, you know, funny. Then they have actually small finlets going across here and across here. They reduce, you know, much uh, small scale turbulence. There's actually a, an example on campus. When, once the campus opens again, go to the building, which is the tower next to the art gallery. You know, we call it the IT tower, I think, whatever it is, building F, E, whatever, the tallest building. And they got this. Uh, slates coming down the side and they have little winglets on it because when the building was originally built it was quite funny like I think a westerly wind came up and it started to sing it had this horrible sound like because turbulence actually built up around it and we had to get the Boeing engineers in and they actually fitted those little winglets on it and it actually stopped the turbulence around the building so here you go you also have a fairly rigid body. That's why you can hold a game fish at the pedunkle here. And it actually doesn't flap around terribly much. And most of the action is coming out of here. And essentially most of your body is giving over, you know, to swimming muscle and you don't have much of a body cavity. So it is the here you can actually see one of those. I put my tuna back. Uh, One of the fastest, the most powerful, a fish that navigates the wide Atlantic on an epic journey. Like us, it's warm blooded. When its muscles fire up, it can actually cook its own flesh. Now, for the first time, we enter its mysterious world to witness behavior never before captured on film. Uh, you can actually watch the entire movie I discovered of Superfish Bluefin Tuna uh, on YouTube. You know, it, it's actually up. I don't know why the BBC actually did that, which is, you know, fantastic. Oops. Uh, hang on. Should I press that one? So, um, the other thing you actually need to do, and people actually forget about that, is uh, when you started to swim, most people have quite a big fear of actually drowning, right? Because we sink to the bottom. So what we actually do is we either develop a certain motion with our hands and feet to keep us afloat. We're constantly trying to contact uh, the gravitational force sucking us down to the bottom of the pool or the sea. Or you actually drown, uh, you actually get uh, a life jacket or you get really fat. Those are the only options for you to basically uh, float. Uh, the problem is, you know, fish have, uh, you know, the same problem. 
So what they basically do is, you know, here is the residual weight, which is actually pulling them down. The pectoral fin provides a little bit of lift, but mostly it's there to stabilize them. And there's a little bit of lift from the tail because that's shaped asymmetrically. However, most uh, buoyancy is achieved by having a swim bladder. Now, we mammals don't have a swim bladder, and it's basically an air fuel sack inside the body. So, you know, if you trout have a really, really nice one, if you ever go trout fishing, you can actually just, you know, take everything out. This actually looks delicious. You can actually eat those eggs. We pay a lot of, you know, money for caviar, but trout actually eggs are quite delicious as well. And you can actually see this, you know, uh, air sack at the back here. There's a little bit of, you know, difference between, you know, a, a physal stone, which has an open connection that basically gulp air and get it up into uh, the uh, air bladder, uh, or physoclists, which have a specialist gland to actually produce gas, but that's quite a minor thing. The whole idea is fish actually have a buoyancy organ, which is very, very unique in the animal kingdom. Now there's a, a few other you know, ingenious solutions. Uh, some sharks who lack an air bladder they don't actually sink to the bottom of the ocean. They still float very efficiently. And they do that by having an enormously large liver. Look at this one here. And the liver is kind of spongy and very fatty and it actually provides buoyancy. Uh, seals have an air sac where they actually gulp air into it. And that air sac of seals is actually used by the Inuit people. We used to call them, you know, the Eskimos, which is terrible the Inuit people now of the uh, basically Northern Arctic. They use those air sacs of seals to tie them to the spears when they actually go hunting, just like a, you know, a boy we use uh, when you go spear fishing. Or you can actually develop a lot of blubber, and this is a cross section uh, of a seal which or, or, or a, a porpoise, a, a dolphin, which is kind of funny, you know, which also keeps you afloat. Now, we started off by introducing to you the sort of perfect swimming machine, and the perfect swimming machine is really, you know, a great right shark. And if you actually look at the design principles, it's fantastic, you know. You got a huge asymmetrically, slightly asymmetrically, you know, tail uh, fin, and that provides an enormous, you know, uh, amount of forward thrust. You have a stabilizing fin here. You have a huge mouse to actually you know, gulp things down. But what you also have is those pectoral fins, and they almost are situated in a perfect triangle, and you have a flat down the side. So if you want to actually, from an engineering perspective, you know, engineer the perfect you know, swimming machine in a fish, you can't actually do much better than that. So there's actually a reason why, you know, sharks look like this. Look at those nice arrangements. And it's almost like having a hovercraft. They sometimes actually are designed like this, with, you know, fins at the bottom. Now, uh, it's almost five o'clock, almost chin, chin and tonic time. Um, you know, that's another problem, you know, that we can't actually go to Fraser Island because five o'clock is, of course, chin and tonic time. Uh, is that uh, and everybody's getting slightly hungry and you know if i look at this picture uh, you have a cross section of two game fish and what you immediately uh, notice i mean here is the vertebrate this is the, the ventral artery this is the torsal artery and you have kind of white muscle but you have a lot of red muscle and then you go and you compare a tuna so let's say a coral trout or a perch or a whiting or whatever it may be there's very very there's no such thing as you know fish flesh uh, the big distinction you can make is between muscle which is red such as this common in tuna and muscle which is white now why is that the case i look at this wonderful diagram i wonder who actually invented that i mean it's very very simple but essentially, if you go and you have had the duration of speed or time, and you have the speed output, you have white muscle, which powers very 
short and intense bursts of forward movement. And then you have red muscle, which is mostly designed for cruising over long distances at a constant speed. So there are anatomically and physiologically you know, differences, uh, of course, between red and white muscles. The biggest one is probably the concentration of myoglobin. Uh, I can't probably, you know, stab myself now to actually draw some blood, you know, which would be quite spectacular. Yeah, I, I'm sure you all guys want to do that, you know, and then I can trip it down. But think about it, you know, I could get a, I could get a knife and I sort of, you know, slash myself and, you know, blood is running down here. Uh, the first thing people actually notice about um, blood is that it's red. And we all know why it's red, because it got hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is is there to uh, you know carry oxygen throughout our body. And what I never actually I should um, it's a bit of a gory story, um, but you learn in physiology or in biochemistry, or I don't know where you actually learn it nowadays, that you you know hemoglobin changes color depending on how much oxygen saturation it has. The idea is that very fresh blood with lots of oxygen, arterial blood, is bright red. Now, you not normally actually never see it because when you actually, you know, cut yourself anywhere and, and you bleed, it's sort of a mixture of renal blood or arterial blood. Uh, but if you have the, you know, uh, bad fortune to have a lung injury, or you're a paramedic, you know, who actually deals with that, it's really a very distinct color. If you actually look at the red here on the screen, it's actually bright red. And it actually, I think, is a, you know, a reminder of how much we actually rely on basic biochemistry for, you know, living. It also means that muscle in a tuna is red because it got a very closely related uh, molecule called myoglobin, meaning, you know, a oxygen carrying a large protein in the muscle. And it basically can store it. So you don't actually have to supply it all the time. That's why we have red muscle and we have the same, you know, kind of setup. So most of the metabolism then of a red muscle is aerobic, whereas the white muscle is anaerobic. That also means that essentially you can use this one for long distance cruising and this one for, you know, short bursts. And when you actually look which fish have red muscle and which fish have white muscle and which ones have basically a combination of the two, it becomes quite apparent that essentially those who don't swim large distances, who are usually small, who are basically hang out and actually ambush prey have mostly white muscle, whereas the cruising fish of the open ocean have, you know, a mixture of both. So next time you go to a fish shop and they have cuts of a mahi-mahi or they have cuts of a tuna, you can actually very easily differentiate between those two muscle types. And when you actually, you know, sink your brain back to why that is, it's, I think, a glorious, you know, demonstration of how biochemistry, physiology uh, come together in actually explaining uh, some of the ecological parameters. Now, we all learn, you know, that fish are cold-blooded. That might be true if you're basically a, a trout or a flathead or whatever. But what we actually do have is that not all fish are cold-blooded because you want to be warm-blooded because warm-blooded organisms just work physiologically, biochemically, you know, much more efficient. The problem is, uh, I don't know about you, but you know, one, the, the, the one thing I, I really detest about diving is getting cold. You know, I get cold you know, quite easily. Uh, because I don't have a lot of insulation. But actually, I think that's actually a problem. Have you actually noticed that during the lockdown, everybody gets more insulation because you kind of sit at home and, and rate the fridge, but never mind. Uh, so, you know, we might actually not have that. So the challenge is when you're in water, we lose heat 
very, very quickly because water has a higher specific heat and hence sucks heat out of a warm blooded organism's body. Now, many other uh, marine mammals have developed you know, the solution of having a fat layer around their core organs. You look at a whale, and this is basically uh, the problem, you know, why we hunted whales for so many centuries, or well, decades, I should really say, about two centuries, because whales have a lot of fat, and so have seals. And the fat could actually be boiled down into oil. And that oil was actually used to light street lamps. Can you, can you believe it in, in, in America and in, in, in Europe? Uh, so obviously, you know, it's just like us downing, you know, uh, you know, carrying a, uh, you know, being closed in a down jacket, it's insulation. Uh, fish who actually swim very fast have a very, very different, you know, adaptation there. And I think it's quite an ingenious one. And how that basically, here's a, uh, an example of, you know, a temperature, you know, uh, recordings of, you know, a tuna and you can actually see their you know body temperature can be 10 degrees higher than the, uh, the water temperature on the outside so how does this basically work it actually works you know what we call a counter current heat exchanger and before cold blood can return back to the body uh, particularly the heart and the internal organs in the brain, they are the most sensitive ones, but also the muscles, it basically gets warmed up by blood running outside towards the muscles. So what you actually achieve by that is that the outer side of the body can stay quite cool, but the core body temperature and its muscles will remain warm because you're not actually losing the heat going out and the colder blood which might actually come back into veins gets actually warmed up again so it's quite ingenious we don't actually have any of that that's why you know we have to actually buy expensive red suits or you know members other members develop big fat deposits you know under their skin fish actually have solved this via this anatomical structure now, the, the reason also why you know, uh, it is possible for mammals to become very, very large is the simple fact that they can float. So the fat actually serves both purposes. Now, here is uh, a you know, kind of confusing looking chart, but one great mystery which the nectar does is they undertake regular uh, in a, uh, long distance movements which we call migrations now there's a bit of a you know debate what actually truly concentrates uh, constitutes a migration but usually there are what we call you know regular and directed movements and the animals switch between feeding grounds and areas for reproduction. So essentially what many nectonic species do, and tuna do it to a certain extent as well, they spend some time in rich feeding grounds. Remember bird, bird migrations that do the same thing. And then they go back where it's actually better to actually give birth to their young or to spawn or whatever. Now, you might say, this is actually very, very odd. Why do you actually want to swim halfway across the world sometimes to achieve that? Well, let's not forget a very fundamental truth and um, oh, getting a bit emotional saying that because, you know, my, my neighbor just across, you know, just across here, Bob, usually I have a glass of wine with Bob, you know, it's all very, uh, it all comes home very, very, uh, very, very badly when we talk about, you know, the coronavirus because his wife actually died, you know, last week. So, 
there we go. And and we actually have to had to calibrate our understanding uh, of uh, sensitivity of our population size towards the older, you know, uh, people quite dramatically in that. However, you know, in biology, you know, not in humans, usually mortality is an order or two of magnitudes highest in the young. And that was also for many, many, you know, thousands of years, pretty much the same case, you know, with humans, you know, the largest mortality rates were the young. Once you were out of your first year, uh, you know, infant mortality, you know, then, you know, you had, well, you didn't have a very long lifespan ahead of you, but usually you could count on about 30 or 40 years. That was more or less it, you know, and until up to the middle ages. And then, it, but it carried off very, very slowly towards the old age. Of course, you know, we didn't have viruses as we have now. Well, we had the plague, uh, but that actually killed, you know, more or less indiscriminately across the uh, age distribution. But normally mortality is highest, you know, for, for the young. And then what you want to do to, you know, counteract that is to, you know, ensure very, very, you know, rapid growth once you're out of this infant stage. So you want to go and go somewhere where it's basically safe, right? And which has lots of food for you know the little ones, and then actually go back uh, uh, to have the nurseries areas before you can actually swim long distances. So here is you know an odd one, and we come back to the plankton as well. You know, quite often nursery areas and spawning sites do not coincide. Now, when you talk to real fish nuts, you know, and <laughs> We have a few of them in the department, but I'm not going to mention any name. You will actually meet them like the, we call them the fishers, you know. The fishers would say, oh, you know, this fish actually spawns over there and then it goes and there's the, the young over there and I can catch them on the bar and blah, blah, blah. Everybody has different opinions about that. But it is actually true that essentially the fish larvae in the nekton quite often get dispersed over long distances. So what the adults do, they try to spawn somewhere to almost evolutionary predict where, or there was an evolutionary pressure to be able to predict, you know, not consciously, but essentially via fitness gains, uh, the, you know, increased survival rate. If you actually say, oh, my, my young will actually land up there if I spawn down here. Which is actually quite cool. Now, uh, some of you might have actually eaten that. Uh, that's white bait. Uh, the original white bait, you know, were, what we basically, you know, have as white bait usually comes from New Zealand and there is small little fish which try to go back up the rivers or the estuaries. In Spain, on the other hand, and in much of Europe, white bait were actually eel larvae. The larvae of eel coming back from the sea to go up the fresh water regions again because eels spawn at sea and they got so badly fished out and it is actually quite astonishing i had you know some aquila is the spanish name for that roberta can probably help me out she what, what is it in portuguese the name for eel it's just a checking whether, whether somebody's actually still listening anybody listening from the from the portuguese no? So, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Okay. So, and, and, and I had a helping of, of this Aquila larvae, and I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's astonishing that they're still around because they had been literally fished out for many, many decades. And what actually turns out to be the case that the Japanese have developed a technique to resemble the shape of the larvae and also paint, I don't know how they do it, the black dots on it so you actually sink their eyes. So here you go. But why they got fished out so successfully and so quickly was because they have a very stereotypical behavior where they go up the same rivers year after year. And they do something 
quite bizarre. Let's sort of stick to those ones first because we all know about the salmon. So eels, including ours in Australia, is a huge mystery. They basically, the adults, swim thousands of kilometers, sometimes across the ocean. They spawn and the early life history stages, the eel larvae, which I just showed you, they go back into fresh water again, but they mature, and then the whole cycle closes again. Now, for European eels, this is actually really bizarre. The adults have to come from, more or less, this is where, you know, my family's farm is somewhere there. Uh, and essentially, they have to battle their way down, you know, this is where, you know, northern Italy is, that's where all the corona cases started in Europe. And then actually, they swim all the way across the Atlantic to the Sargasso Sea, they spawn there, and then the young have to be transported. Again, in that current, remember lecture number one or two, is the Gulf current. It basically brings the larvae back, and then they have to make their way back up into the rivers. Quite an astonishing, you know, journey. We also have things like, I mean, this is a very famous, you know, uh, example where the turtles, they go between the seagrass beds, of Brazil, and then I go to Asuncion Island, which is very, very small to actually lay the eggs. Uh, here's another you know, example of those eels, more about the seals. And it really is a very, very enigmatic story. But we also have the same thing in, in Australia, and ours, here's the web address if you want to see the uh, full story. Our eels from the freshwater, they go over to Vanuatu. And you know, we know that because some complete nutters track them with GPS track trackers all the way from Sydney to Vanuatu. And the really bizarre thing is, it's actually friends of mine, and it was actually financed by the Austrian Science Foundation. Go and figure that. So we actually had to go to Vanuatu, but we don't actually know how the larvae actually go back. So next time you eat an eel, eels are very nice, you know, if they're smoked, uh, then, you know, uh, they basically come from halfway across you know, the world. Uh, and also, you know, what is very, very famous, we have, you know, different species of whales going, you know, between feeding grounds, which are usually in the high Arctic or in the high Antarctic. And we are extremely fortunate in this part of the world, you know, to, to be right at, you know, the epicenter, I should say, I mean, the, this is actually quite odd, you know. Look at this. Somebody cut Harvey Bay off, you know. No, obviously didn't like it. There's also no Fraser Island. Uh, never mind. Uh, we are very, very, you know, fortunate to be able to uh, have very, very spectacular, uh, re you know, stopover places. I actually reckon, you know, the the way watching in Harvey Bay is as good as anywhere in the world. The only really, you know, you know, uh, more spectacular one is. If you ever manage to go to the Asu Islands, which are somewhere here, you can actually go and watch sperm whales in a four meter rubber duck, um, which, you know, redefines your level of, you know, fear, but, you know, you do it once. So it's, it's actually very, very good. Sperm whales, you know, and, and a really bizarre thing about the sperm whales is if you read the old books of the whalers and even Moby Dick, if anybody actually wants to know something about classic literature, read Moby Dick, and the old whalers that talked about before the whale surfaces, the sea becomes oily and you can smell it. And I thought, come on, this is complete bullshit. I'm a scientist. Now, how can the sea become you know, quiet and oily before a whale surfaces? And I tell you, if you go and you know, watch sperm whales in a small boat and you don't know where it's going to come up, it actually does become oily and they smell absolutely foul uh, because the air coming out from the lungs of course yeah so it's quite quite interesting so there's something with the old tales and we also have in in the south pacific you know a very very spectacular uh you know movement of you know the big eye tuners and of course we know quite a lot of this you know because the fishing industry of course for tuna it's very interesting to know, you know exactly where to, where I go, but we don't actually know, you know, why we actually suspect they might actually follow the food resources. 
uh, and that might actually track them over time and in space. Now, that actually gets us to the feeding, you know, uh, and, and here is an absolute enigma. And that is, you look at, you know, this, you know, ray shark here, and here is a seven gill one, and here's a manta ray, and here's another, you know, deep sea shark. They're all cartilaginous, i.e., uh, you know, fish, you know, without bones. And it is truly, you know, uh, buzzing when we come to really big, gigantic plankton feeders, marine vertebrates. There's no really big turtles or birds. And that is kind of odd if you really kind of think about it because we find them in, in other groups. Uh, and they're very good at diving, but you know, they never actually managed to get terribly big. I mean, the biggest thing is an emperor penguin, which is about that size. You know. Oh, talking about penguins. Um, I shouldn't really say that, but I mean, it's actually quite funny. You know, nowadays, you know, everybody's is on the streaming services and you switch between Netflix and Amazon Prime or whatever. But if you actually go onto SBS, you know, on demand, it's for free. And they just have released a preview of Checkers 0.5 Bad Grandpa. And of course, we all are familiar with the Check as movies. And so basically, Bad Grandpa, you know, it's of course one of the actors and they make him look very old. And he drives over a penguin at an American burger place. And it's actually a statue, it's not a real penguin, but you know, if you want to see a funny penguin episode, here we go. I don't know why my brain goes on that one because we saw it yesterday. So it's Grand Bar 0.5 available on SBS uh, on demand for free. I, I'm not getting paid by them, but it's actually something quite funny to watch. Uh, right. So, and, 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 and we are quite actually, you know, puzzled by that. Uh, one of the reasons could be that both of them essentially produce on land. And, you know, maybe if you want to swim and you have to waddle to the water, you cannot support a very, very large body. We don't actually quite know. The other thing which is very odd is that we haven't really got any bony fish which have evolved into gigantic plankton feeders. And that is, you know, possibly, you know, uh, something be uh, can be explained that we had very, very large bony fish. We know from uh, uh, the paleontological record, and this is, of course, the KT boundary. Remember, that's when the big uh, meteorite fell to you know, Earth and dinosaurs went extinct and all that kind of stuff. And they never quite actually took off again. So there was a mass extinction, and it could be a complete quirk of evolution that we never actually regained the bony fish. We got all sorts of things again. We got the manta rays, we got uh, the big uh, whales, we got the seven gill sharks, and we got the whale sharks, and even, you know, very reasonably large sea cows. But, you know, uh, in the bony fish, the bony fish stayed, let's say, you know, two meters for a really big duna, which is a complete mystery, you know, in terms of the diversity they have otherwise. So here you look at, you know, a whale shark, and we don't actually have that, you know, in the bony fish, which, you know, coming back right to, bit, to the beginning is, you know, what we actually talked about, you know, the diversity of fishes is quite a mystery. And, you know, Hang on, hang on. Some more. Boom, boom, boom. And that's, you know, the, the, the lecture for the day because my, my voice can't actually do terribly much more, sorry for that. Um, 